Welcome to Spring Law's Spring Forward Legal Updates webinar series. This series is designed to provide a comprehensive legal overview of key issues related to employment law and human rights in Ontario. Spring Law is a virtual employment law firm advising on workplace legal issues for employers, employees, freelancers, and executives from a wide range of industries. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and find it useful and informative. To reach our team, please visit us at springlaw.ca. And now to our presenters. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Spring Board Legal Update for 2023. My name is Lisa Stam, one of the lawyers here at Spring Law, and today I am presenting with my colleague, Emily Sue. Um, if you are one of our clients, you already know that we are employment and contracts lawyers at our virtual law firm based out of Ontario, but we um, assist nationally. Um, we welcome any of those that are new to our webinars. Feel free to use the chat function in the uh, the platform, I think everyone's used to these platforms now and can figure it out intuitively these days, but uh, it's GoToWebinar, so go ahead and grab the uh, uh, handout in the handouts tab and ask us any questions along the way. If we can't get to it during the 30 minutes, we will uh, try and get to you afterwards. Finally, for more information on our firm, please feel free to come to our website at springlaw.ca where we have a variety of resources there including our award-winning blog a post every week that we post every Wednesday, um, a link to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, and then information about our innovative subscription program for employers, as well as um, our online legal services, including our fairly new Boss Law Bootcamp. Okay, let's jump in. Here is my colleague, Emily. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Emily. Thank you, Lisa. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. We are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And this territory is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, uh, Lisa, just to talk about our legal disclaimers. Yes, we're lawyers. What can we what can we say? Um, but this is all legal information. It's not legal advice. Um, you know, we're lawyers. No talk is complete without a disclaimer. But here are all the details. We really are just uh, giving you information that will um, help you issue spot and um, and then you need to dig into the specific details of your case. Okay, so today's roadmap, um, we have 30 minutes. We know people are busy. We want to get in and out with you. So here's our roadmap for today. Um, we're going to talk about termination provisions. We're going to talk about headaches and costs and, and then practice tips how to avoid them. So I just, you know, um, as, as a context to, uh, for back, uh, context for why we're digging into one section of an employment agreement, typically uh, all the employment law case law is really a fight basically a fight around how much people get on termination and what is their termination entitlement so that termination clause can really be the make or break um, section of a contract so it really is one of the most important and, and one of the most expensive parts of the employment relationship so it is worth it to get it right and to um, invest that the time and resources up front to um, get compliant with the fast changing law. It's, it, and over the last couple of years, it has been a little bit nutty how, how much the law keeps, nuances keep coming out around this. Um, as as a, um, a final point before I hand it over to Emily to dig into the specifics of, of what are uh, provisions to keep an eye on, or, or um, not provisions, but sections of a termination clause to keep an eye on, courts will not care if you intended to give more in the contract than what you actually wrote down, or if in the end you did give more to an employee, what courts are gonna look at is, is the actual document compliant? And then they'll decide whether or not to set aside the provision if it's not compliant. So they will not fix your contract to bring it into compliance, which is why we spend all this time up front being clear about what what you need to get right in the first place. And I, you know, we deal with a lot of US clients that have operations in Canada, and so this, this idea of redlining a contract to bring it down to what would have otherwise uh, been in compliance, that doesn't exist up here. Courts will say, you employer should have gotten this right in the first place. And you can't benefit from that ambiguity or mistake. 
The employee is always a vulnerable party uh, and contracts will always be construed in their favor. It's, it's why it's, it's probably one of those fundamental philosophical differences between US and Canadian employment law where uh, it is a much more employee friendly environment and employees, you know, they get the benefit of the doubt in any contractual dispute. So um, with that context and why it matters and why it doesn't matter, you can't fix it later by giving them the right amount. You have to get it right in the contract in the first place. So let me hand it over to Emily, who is going to dig in to the actual provisions. Thank you, Lisa. So I want to start off by providing a brief overview about termination provisions, you know, why you should care about them, red flags to spot, and I know you're all here for the juicy part of the presentation, the practice tips, the practical guidance. So I'll do my best to zip through this section as much as possible. Thanks, Lisa. So before an employee gets terminated, many employers, most employers, will think about what termination package to give to their employees. But to contrary to popular belief, the two weeks notice that you sometimes hear about may not actually be sufficient in Canadian, under the eyes of Canadian law, for those of you who are outside of Canada, um, maybe some of you who, are, uh, who have workforces in Canada but are located, um, headquartered maybe in the U.S. So then the question becomes, how do you know how much an employee is going to get, what they're entitled to? A good way to think about it is to keep in mind that there are three main sources that dictate what an employee is going to be entitled to on a termination without cause. The first of which is statute. So you want to look at the minimum standards legislation. In Ontario, for example, that is the Employment Standards Act 2000, also more popularly known as the ESA. And the minimum standards legislation will set out the absolute bare minimum to which an employee is entitled no matter what. So this an employee is going to get this on a without cause termination no matter what. The second source of an employee's entitlements is common law um, and that is basically judge made law and judges in Canada are very employee friendly um, and they've typically awarded anywhere between one to even 24 months or more of notice um, for indefinite term employees. And that is a lot, it's a lot to take in. Um, so then how do, you, how do you get out of that? Can you get out of that? And the answer is yes, uh, you can get out of that. And that's what we're here to talk about today, um, which is contract. Um, next slide, please. Without a contract, your indefinite term employees are entitled to common law notice and your fixed term employees um, are entitled to the balance of the contract, which can be quite a bit. And it, in some cases, uh, for smaller business, it can it can come at quite a, a really big cost. Um, so, what can what can a contract do for you? Well, it can provide protection. And even though so, even though you can't contract out of statute, out of the minimum standards legislation, you can contract out of the common law, which is a good news. Um, what termination provisions um, in employment contracts can provide is certainty of terms for both parties. So after termination, but before lawyers are dragged into disputes about termination entitlements, often the parties can still at least try to point out what was agreed upon at the beginning. And that can make quite a big difference when it comes to how long the dispute is and how expensive it gets. Next slide. So most employers I've worked with lean towards limiting an employee's termination entitlement in a contract to the minimum standards requirements. Um, so that might be as low as one week for shorter term employees. It really does depend often on the length of an employee's um, employment uh, of their service. Sometimes you'll see contracts that contain termination provisions providing greater than the statutory minimum. So this is usually for higher level employees. Um, the contract might say something like, the employee is entitled to two weeks of notice per year of completed service on a termination without cause. Um, in uh, another situation in which sometimes you'll see greater than statutory minimums in a contract is if an employer is trying to lock in a desirable candidate and just to sweeten the pot, they might give them more than stat minimums in their contract. Next slide. 
And as some of you might know, many termination provisions are unfortunately unenforceable. Um, and I'm gonna give you some tips in a minute just to how to spot red flags and, and look at language that invalidates termination provisions. Um, and just to keep in, it's good to keep in mind that I'm not trying to give you pointers on how to do illegal analysis. Um, it's always a good idea to get legal counsel because the law is always evolving and what may have appeared enforceable last year may appear less so this year. Um, but it's important to help understand, help you understand and, and create a framework for how to understand that there are many issues that could pop up in an employment agreement. So on to the red flags. Next slide. Thank you. So a lot of, um, if a, a lot of contracts will contain termination provisions, um, they'll contain language that try to contract out of the minimum standards legislation. And if this happens, the entire termination provision may be found to be unenforceable. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and so a court will look at termination provisions that appear anywhere in a contract. Um, it might, you know, you might have with cause termination provisions, without cause termination clauses, resignation notice period clauses, clauses that address probationary periods. They're all considered to be termination uh, related clauses. So they're all, it they might be looked at as a whole. So it's important to ensure every aspect of it, um, of these termination provisions are valid and enforceable. Next slide. Uh, a lot of employment contracts will contain termination for just cause provisions. And we've seen so many, um, but I say, I say that the vast majority try to contract out of minimum standards legislation, whether it's the employer's intention or not. And oftentimes employers aren't trying to contract out of the minimum standards legislation, but they just do that, do so accidentally. It's not, it's not something that they do on purpose. Um, but as Lisa said earlier, it's uh, going to be the contract, the language itself that a court will be looking at rather than the intention of the employer when they're interpreting whether or not an employment contract contains enforceable or unenforceable provisions. Um, I see a lot of uh, just cause provisions that say that um, in the event that an employee is terminated for just cause, they're entitled to nothing or something along those lines. Um, but then courts will consider the question, um, you know, what does just cause mean? And in some jurisdictions, you look at the actual minimum standards legislation and the words just cause or cause isn't actually defined. Um, in other cases, um, a termination provision might say that um, the employees um, can't, if they get terminated on a just cause basis, they um, won't get anything and um, and then the employer tries to list out all of the different situations in which an employee can be terminated for just cause. Um, but in this, the relevant statute that applies only restricts certain actions that an employee uh, commits in order for that employee to be terminated for just cause or getting nothing. Um, and the employer is trying to expand the list. So that's something that a court will be looking for and trying to figure out whether or not uh, these termination provisions provisions are enforceable and these are very tricky so you want to be careful and get legal advice where you can uh, next slide well and this is the whole wakesdale case so for anyone who's heard about the case of wakesdale that came out in june of 2020 that flipped everything upside down for uh the world of hr law the problem in that was that the without the with cause section ex you know it, it expanded in ontario what our definition of um of a, a, a termination is a, a just cause termination is and it it, it based it inadvertently contracted out of the employment standards act on ontario and because it was you know part of that termination section it knocked the whole thing out so and in that case that employee wasn't even being fired for cause it's just that the um employment lawyer for the employee argued that it was um, knocking the whole section out so this is where this this um has become a really hot live issue of looking at the with cause section to um, see if the whole without cause section is enforceable. And it, it's not intuitive to any of us yet because uh, in, in real life, it doesn't make much sense, but this is how the contracts are being interpreted by the courts. On the other hand, um, you have without cause sections. So we talked about just cause 
with cause provisions, um, but without cause sections can also cause problems. And many, I've seen many without cause provisions that, for example, say that an employee won't get benefits during any notice period or, or say that an employee is going to get maybe two weeks of notice per year of service up to a maximum of X weeks. Um, but that maximum is actually less than what they would max out at under statute. Um, or maybe the provision will list what an employee will get on a termination without cause, but then it you know, sort of accidentally maybe excludes certain statutory provision or statutory entitlements rather. Um, so in Ontario, employees are not only entitled to notice, but they're also entitled to a lump sum payment of severance. Um, and sometimes you'll have a contract that inadvertently um, contracts out of that by not referencing at all. Um, the list goes on. I mean, if a contract has these not so great clauses, an employee might be entitled to common law notice or even um, the balance of the term, depending on what kind of contract they have. So it's important to keep all of this in, in mind and just know that there are um, a lot of issues that can come up with termination clauses. For so their severance piece in Ontario, it's for, if the employee's been, uh, it only kicks in if the employee's been with the organization for at least five years and it's a, a larger organization with 2.5 million payroll. But so it, what we do run across is smaller employees and the employee's only been there for a year or two. Severance isn't even a legal entitlement, but the contract still needs to reference it if you're in Ontario because it's um, it could be that one day the organization will get big enough and that employee may have more than five years of severance. And so to, to not properly reference it is a way of contracting out of the ESA. So just as an example of, it doesn't matter if in the moment that you terminate someone, whether or not they're actually exceeding these ESA um, or um, uh, minimums or coming under it or above it, uh, depending on the issue, um, it has to be right um, in, in a, uh, in, in, um, universally. We're seeing lots of great questions come in. So let's get through all the red flags and then we'll start answering them because there's, um, and I'll shorten the next section in order to address some of these questions that are coming in. Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of red flags and a lot of, um, a lot of issues that come up. So it's always good to get a, an employer's eye or a lawyer's eyes rather to look at it just because they're so complicated. Um, to, con to conclude the red flags, um, sometimes I see contracts that have blanket statements and you might see them in your contracts as well that say something like the employee will get nothing save and accept as required by the applicable statute or or something along the lines of even if the employee's contract contravenes a statute the employer will at all times comply with the statute and the employer intends to comply with the statute um, as you know courts will look at the contract itself and not the employer's intentions when drafting the contract um, often and so Many courts have found that these provisions don't actually do anything to save contracts uh, that try to contract out of the minimum standards legislation. So it's important not to be fooled by thinking that saving language will um, will work. And uh, and just as a final note, it's um, always remember that termination provisions can appear anywhere in the contract, even if it's under a heading that has nothing to do with termination. So long as termination is addressed. Um, it will be considered to be a termination related provision that is going to receive a lot of very in-depth scrutiny by courts. Um, okay, let's talk about headaches and costs for a, a moment. And like I said, I'll go through this quickly just so we can get to the questions. Um, the, so the what happens when that termination provision is invalid? Uh, the impact will really depend on what kind of contract it is. So if it's an indefinite contract, which means you know, a permanent one, you know, uh, and, and permanent whether or not it's full-time, part-time, salary, hourly, none of that matters. It, 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 the, the main buckets are, is it indefinite or is it a fixed term? All to be distinguished from an independent contractor agreement, but that's not what we're talking about today. So these indefinite contracts, the... The most expensive moment is when you're ending the contract and if the contract termination provision is not enforceable what the courts will do is they will set aside that termination section and it will substitute in common law so you know the goal is to roll out enforceable contracts it can be minimum standards if if you're an employer that or the rule itself is very frontline for example and you're going to offer up only 
minimum standards upon termination. It can be that, or it can be, you know, minimum standards plus a week or two for every year of service. Um, if it's more senior, often you see three or four weeks um, uh, of, of notice or pay in lieu of notice for every year of service. So the contract tends to be some, some middle ground between the minimum standards and what the common law would award. If the contract is set aside, however, the court will substitute in common law. And that's that, you know, one to 24 months. Uh, just recently, actually, um, you'll start to see some headlines that the, the um, another case has come out where it was more than 24 months. We're starting to see a handful. There's probably still maybe a dozen out there, but, but there are some extenuating circumstances where it may be more than 24 months. But I, I think right now, most of the time, your ceiling is going to be around 24 months, but that, that can really add up. The other uh, impact uh, is if it's a fixed term contract, the default legal position is if the termination, if you have to fire someone in the middle of a fixed term contract, basically you're ending the contract early, um, the default legal position without any provision saying otherwise is that that employee gets the balance of the contract. So if you fire someone in month, let's say you, you hire someone for a one year contract, and it's not working out, you fire them in month three, the default legal position is they're entitled to the remaining nine months because the deal was that they were um, gonna work for a year uh, under this contract. The way around that, um, and, the, and a reasonable way around this is that you have a termination provision in there that says if, if the contract's terminated prior to the end of the fixed term contract, they'll get X, whether it's minimum standards or some sort of you know week or two or three per year service. I mean, it's a fixed term, so you would typically have you know a month or or some sort of um, amount in there if it has to be um, um, ended earlier. So the the impact on having an unenforceable termination provision depends on the type of the agreement, um, and as you can imagine, for the indefinite, it will really depend on how long the person has been with you the liabilities um, oh, go ahead just to, sorry to interrupt but it, for those of you who are wondering why employees are you know some situations entitled to so much it's because and why courts are so employee friendly it's because they see that there's this sort of imbalance of power the power difference between employers and employees and they're based on that kind of understanding they're trying to you know, equalize um, that, that uh, imbalance of power. Um, and so they are typically more employee friendly. And that's kind of uh, just a little bit of a little bit of information about why all, all of this seems to, you know, put so much uh, on an employer um, and yeah. making sure that an employer gets everything right. Yeah, there's no wiggle room, unfortunately. Um, okay, so what do liabilities uh, include? You know, if if the court does substitute in common law, what the, what the court, the rationale, what they will say is you employer must make this employee whole, you know, but for the termination, what would the employee otherwise have gotten during this full notice period? So you fire someone, they've been with you for 10 years, let's say, um, and you, you, you know, you offer up only Employment Standards Act minimums, they, they sue for wrongful dismissal, they win because they argue I should have gotten a longer period. Let's say the court substitutes in 10 months. The court will say, you employer now have to continue during that 10 month notice period, anything that he, he or she would have otherwise earned. So base salary for sure, but um, continue benefits. If there was pension and benefit contributions, um, is there any accrued vacation, um, commissions, uh, non-discretionary bonuses? And then where we start to get into all the battles is you start looking at the plan documents. Does that include equity? You know, is there a vesting cliff in there somewhere? Does it, you know, um, is there regular salary increases that they always get automatically? Um, any any promises that they were going to get something next month and now they're not? So this, that, and that's, that's why employment lawyers are busy because there's just a lot to fight over about what we mean they're going to get during the notice period. So let's pop over to practice tips. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll still have a, uh, five minutes to get through some of the questions. Thanks, Lisa. So you're probably thinking that all of this is quite a bit, um, it's quite a lot. And maybe throughout this presentation, some of you are realizing that your contracts might contain a red flag or two, or maybe are full of red flags. You're worrying, you know, what should I do? What do I do next? Um, well, the first thing to do is to take a step back and um, take a deep breath and, uh, and ask yourself, 
first of all, do your employees have employment contracts? If the answer to that question is no, now is as, as good a time as any to get them in place. Um, and you want to make sure you get a lawyer to help with that because it is, <coughs> excuse me, it is a real minefield. And what lawyers are trying to do is design something that gets around those, those mines. Um, if you do have employment contracts in place, it's still a good idea to get lawyers to take a look at them. Um, and this is the case even if a lawyer drafted them or reviewed them you know, over a year ago, because um, as we mentioned before, employment law, you know, there are always nuances that are coming out and it evolves quite rapidly. And I think it evolves rapidly enough that it justifies an annual review at the very least to ensure that your contracts uh, are enforceable. And as a part of that, it's also a good idea to distinguish between your existing employees versus your new hires when you're when you're thinking about giving people new contracts. Um, they typically aren't going to have the same contracts. Unlike new hires, existing employees have to, in order for them to sign off on a contract, they have to get something known as fresh consideration, which is a legal concept and and basically means that they have to get something extra in return for them signing this new contract. So your new hires and new employees, in exchange for them signing the contract, they're going to get the job, they're going to get compensation, um, and they're going to provide you with services. But your existing employees, they already have the job, they already have the compensation. So in order for the contract to be valid, they have to have something extra, this fresh consideration, and that can range from, you know, uh, extra vacation time to a signing bonus to a moderate raise, maybe even benefits if you don't have those in place. I really use your imagination with this one, but it should be of value to the employee in relation to their circumstances. So maybe a Starbucks gift card for a CEO may not be may not be sufficient. Um, uh, so these are just some 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 tips to keep in mind. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to talk about how to put these practice tips into practice. Yeah, just a quick practice note that uh, it's a difference between US and Canadian employment law also is that, that mere continued employment is not sufficient consideration, right? Whereas I understand, and I'm not qualified to practice in the US, but I understand that um, the ongoing ability to work at the employer is consideration. So if you're working with HR headquarters that are based out of the U US, that's something to just comment that if you're going to roll out new contracts that contain the termination provision and take away a right, basically, take away common law, um, you need to give them something in exchange for that. All right, so um, a lot of the questions coming in are, how do we do this? How frequently? Um, what should it look like? Um, uh, if it's not in compliance with other clauses, how do you fix it? So here, here is... Um, our way of really listening to our clients and trying to roll out options around how to make this more cost and time effective for employee, uh, employers. So um, we have a number of um, integrated online legal services that um, you can uh, purchase on our website to grab one of our templates um, and, and, and work with that document to cross-reference with your own. And then, you know, pull in 101 legal services at the end of that if you still need it. But over the years, you know, we've, we've just heard from our employer clients, how do we do this in a more cost-effective way internally? How do we build out our internal system so that we're not always having to go um, to the often more than anything time-consuming process of having a lawyer nerd out on our contracts? So this is a way of, of pulling in an internal resource and being able to do that internally. It's not pure DIY, you know, we're always still here for any um, ongoing um, help that you might need. But this allows um, employers to work at their own pace of, around how they would like to keep their own contracts uh, enforceable. We are in a tough moment um, when it comes to the enforceability of our contracts right now. It, it is, uh, the case law is hopping. I think this is all a, a product of post-COVID, of lots of complications around, um, you know, these leaves that are wrapping up, of people looking at frustration issues, at, at um, our labor shortage, and and now inflation. We're we're just still sort of dealing with the aftermath of an unprecedented pandemic, 
and and the courts uh, and the case law is just looking with more scrutiny at termination provisions. Um, so this is uh, um, a way to help do this in a cost-effective way. Our firm actually recently has has done a number of roundtables with our lawyers to to look at our employment contract template and really attack it from a, an employee lawyer perspective to just really drill down to what we hope is um, a great version of this for today. I, I fully acknowledge a new case might come out tomorrow, but right now, you know, we're we're quite happy about it. Um, and so, you know, um, feel free to contact us about that. So let me let me get to some of the questions. So um, and some of them might have been answered in the course of the of the talk. So if I have a termination clause that says the employee is entitled to ESA only, are they still entitled to common law? Not if your contract is enforceable. It's totally legit, especially for certain roles to only offer up Employment Standards Act or code, you know, minimum standards. Um, often about a week per year of service up to around eight weeks. That's for most of the jurisdictions in Canada. Um, and then common law only kicks in if the contract gets set aside and that's what the courts are going to um, substitute in. Um, does a termination clause, um, if it's not in compliance, okay, wait, does a termination clause being not in compliance clause, other clauses, Emily, can you see us as well? If it's, no. <laughs> Does the termination clause being not in compliance cause other clauses to come into question? So oh, I think okay. that this is, yeah, this is um, typically, I mean, it, it can, um, but it's usually going to be the other termination related clauses that are going to be kicked out, not necessarily, you know, your hours of work provision or, or clauses that are going to be kicked out just because your termination clause is, um, is not enforceable. I think this is, um, this is definitely something that is ongoing um, as, as a debate in the in the courts. But um, as of right now, I would say that um, enforceability is restricted when it comes to uh, interpreting termination provisions, restricted only to other termination related provisions. OK, great. Um, does a severability clause help with that or not anymore? So um, that's similar to a, a saving clause where uh, Emily already talked about that, so I won't repeat that actually. Um, this is a really important question. Can an employee argue that they didn't know what they were signing off on when they were signing the employee contract? And this is especially, I think, important when you're going to roll out a an updated or new contract to an existing employee. It is important in that situation to really point out and never try and hide the fact that you're rolling out um, a, a new termination provision. Um, you don't need to give them legal advice on this or, you know, but encourage, like, encourage them if they want to go get um, someone else to take a look at it. That's important. Um, but you, you don't need, when it's a brand new candidate that you're hiring, you don't need to explain, we're only giving you statutory minimums. If this gets set aside, you're going to get common law. So you, know, you don't need to go into that level of detail. It is totally fine to have a termination clause that's only statutory minimums. And it's kind it, it just a little bit, it's buyer beware, a little bit on that front, is when an employer tries to trick someone, you know, or if it's seen that way. So if you hide it or you give disingenuous answers or, you know, but if an employee asks you, well, can I get a week per year service? You can, or, you know, can I get a month for every year of service in my termination provision? You can say yes or no, but um, it's it's part of that conversation. So you it, you do not need to tell them that, that um, they're signing off common law. You just need to be forthright about what you are offering up a new candidate. Um, the yeah. other question, go ahead, Emily. Yeah. It's also a good idea to give your employee a bit of time, your prospective employee, a bit of time to get legal yes. advice so your, their lawyer can explain to them that they're only getting stat minimums. I, I, we usually recommend, you know, about a week um, of time for the employee to go get legal advice and, and review the contract in detail. Um, if you're having them, if you want them to sign the contract, you know, it's a 10 page contract and you want have to sign it in five minutes, you know, on the spot, then it might not, the contract itself might be, might not be seen as valid because they had to sign it under duress. So, um, you know, just being, I think a lot of this come down, comes down to common sense um, and what you think is, you know, what somebody might think is reasonable. And, um, and so giving them some more time and, and, you know, if they're 
asking whether or not they should get a lawyer to look at it. I mean, not not discouraging them from doing that is um, it's going to be beneficial in the long run most of the time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, when we say common law, is that just the Bartle factors, which is a case from the 60s that is still the leading case on this, or other things or common frameworks considered or used? So it's it's common law is the is is case law. It's it's judge made law. Our common law system is this collection of case law where judges are are bound to precedent, so cases that are are decided before them, and so it's this incremental change all the time. What what the underlying legal rationale always will be is what kind of cushion does this employee need to get to their next job? So, you know, and 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 to answer that question, they'll look at things like the Bartle factors, which are age, like the service, nature of employment, et cetera. But really they're always looking ultimately at what cushion to get to the next job. So a uh, good question about what, what actually is common law. Sorry, we should have clarified that. Um, is, okay, here's, uh, I, I see the time, but I know that these are, uh, uh, you know, drop off if you're, if you have, somewhere you got to get to and you can pop onto our youtube channel um to grab the um the recording of this to hear the end if um you do have to pop off um another question here is when you uh, sorry can you please clarify is it better to list reasons for cause or not okay so the in ontario it is uh, it, uh, important to identify or maybe i should reword that it's important to not create extra items on a list that are going to expand the definition and then um, knock it out altogether. So what I can say is that our firm has taken a hard look at this and, and it's true. When you start listing all the reasons for why you might be able to fire someone for cause, often it's from a position of these are our company's values and this is, the, you know, it's it's more of a um an important hr piece of of making it clear what job expectations are but you you from a legal point of view you run into problems in the termination provisions so we are have evolved on this a bit given how much the case law is picking apart every little nuance of the provision and we are recommending at this point to not list all these items in the uh in, in a just cause termination section Emily, do you want to expand a bit on on Wakesdale and just to specify how we, for anyone who's from Ontario, I think we should um, specify that because we have it written out in our uh, uh, regulation to our Employment Standards Act, how this needs to look. In Ontario specifically, an employer is allowed to terminate an employee without providing them with notice um, for um, only basically for willful misconduct, neglect, or willful um, or disobedience or willful neglect of duty. Um, that is not trivial um, and not condoned by the employer. So it's a very it's very specific wording. Um, if you're going to have a just cause provision, um, you're going to want to make sure that just cause is either defined using that language that is in the legislation, um, or or maybe um, you can just say that if an employee is going to be terminated for just cause, they're going to be entitled to um, the minimum, only entitled to the minimum um, amounts that are set out in the, um, the, the applicable minimum standards legislation. So on Ontario, that's the ESA. Um, basically, because cause isn't defined, um, and the word cause doesn't actually appear anywhere in Ontario's uh, legislation. It does appear in some other jurisdictions legislation in Canada, but not in Ontario. Um, it's important to be very careful about whether or not you actually define it. And if you do define it, how it's defined, um, just to be just to make sure that you're in compliance with it. Um, that makes sense. I think it is. There are a lot of nuances here um, and a lot of a lot of details um, that have to be considered when when you're looking at a contract but i guess that's where that's where employment lawyers uh come in um and just like kind of look into the red flags i and i think there is a shift i mean there's a another person has asked um if termination for cause clauses can be used to undermine the without clause why include them and i think that's the fundamental question many people are asking right now is why bother if, if it's going to screw up the whole contract why bother and so we are. I, I do anticipate we're going to see a, a, a big shift on this. 
um, whether to include detailed just cause provisions. I think, you know, a decade ago, it was good to do that. So there was, there was specificity, it wasn't ambiguous, it helped promote firm culture and firm values. But we're definitely seeing a shift away from that because it's undermining the ability to enforce the rest of the clause. Um, and so it's, it's important to, uh, you know, if you have nothing in there about just cause, just cause is still defined at common law. There's still a court understanding about what it is. But you just, in Ontario at least, we need to be careful that we're not saying every just cause provision, you get nothing. Because the reality is our statute doesn't say that. That regulation to the statute, and this is that Wakesdale case, doesn't say that. So um, I, I hope we're not confusing it. The point is just cause clauses um we are in a a moment of change i think on this issue and we are no longer recommending that you put in a detailed version of this at all because because of of how much it threatens the rest of the without cause termination so um it's it's why we're you know we're we're pushing our employment contracts right now because we think we have come up with a good balance of of still saying you can't you know that we that we employer um, reserve the right to fire you with a cause, but uh, within the termination provision itself. So, um, and then one final question: When giving out new contracts do you, um, at raise time, for example, can this be? Um, wait, when giving out new contracts to existing employees, you state at raise time. Can this be the annual increase that everyone is getting? So this fresh consideration issue: If you're looking to update your contracts and you've got someone coming up for a promotion, for example, and they're going to get a good raise, that's a great time to roll out a fresh contract to them because they're getting consideration through that that moment in their in, in the uh, career. If everybody every year always just gets a cost of living increase, for example, that may not be sufficient consideration if it's a thing they would have just always gotten. So it, I, I, I hate to say it depends. I avoid that. But I do think consideration has to be something extra that a person is getting in exchange for this new contract. So if it's something they otherwise always would have gotten, it's not extra anymore. Um, any final comments, Emily? I, I think I know we've gone quite a bit over, but um, I know this is this is a hard topic. We shouldn't always try and shove things into 30 minutes, but we try. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a, it's a big topic. It is really the bread and butter of many employer employment lawyers practices and the key source of many employers headaches um, and and you know as we always say it's it's good to you know maybe spend a little bit up front to get enforceable contracts to make sure that you're avoiding you know maybe a ten thousand or hundred thousand dollar problem down the road um, and many nights of lost sleep so um, yeah so that's, that's what we do and uh, and we are very familiar with this um, but uh, yeah, definitely lots of lots of nuance and and lots to talk about when it comes to this subject. Yeah. So with, um, with that, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, our next webinar is on March twenty second, also uh, ten thirty in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. The topic will be employment agreements. So today we talked about the termination provision. That next webinar we will talk about all of them, all of the sections in the agreement. Um, and and really uh, talk more holistically about how all the other things fit together. We'll identify some of the red flags or more commonly um, headache generating provisions uh, to take a look at. So that will be in our um, uh, next um, session, including how to sync those up with your um, manuals and policies and that kind of thing. So come visit our website if you want to stay in the loop generally. Um, and if you um, want to check out our other webinars that we've done on different areas of law, please come to our YouTube channel, follow us on social, um, sign up for our monthly newsletters, and hopefully we'll see you next month at our next webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone.